we got to understand what is and what is not a foundation of black American. Because some people try to be confused. Let's, let's break some of this shit down. This is very important for us to get on code. Now, who is and who's not a foundation of black American? And you can go to officialfba.com. We talk about this. We got a section. If you scroll to the bottom, we, we kind of break some of this stuff down. Who is a foundation of black American and who's not a foundation of black American? Because some people, I've had some mixed people ask me about it. Now, let's be clear. Foundational Black American, that's a person who can trace their bloodline lineage back to the American system of slavery. Okay? This is a person who's the foundation of Black American. If you can trace your bloodline lineage back to the American system of slavery, then you're a foundational Black American. Now, to be a foundational Black American, at least one family member, one parent, has to come from a non-immigrant background, at least one. They have to come from a non-immigrant background that can be traced to American slavery. Okay, let's be clear. Let's, let's break some of this stuff down so there's no confusion. We even have it on the site, by the way. If you go to officialfba.com, we, we got some of this stuff broken down on the beautiful site, Official FBA. We break a lot of it down. See, we're emptying the pot. The pot is getting empty. Now, some people say, well, Tariq, my, my mom is an immigrant, but my dad, he's a foundational black American. Okay, well, you are a foundational black American. Somebody said, I'll get on Amanda Seals in a minute. Now, she says her dad is from Boston. She always says, well, my mom is from Grenada and my dad is from Boston. Is her dad a descendant of American slavery? Just because your dad is a black American, is that motherfucker a descendant of American slavery? You dig? Is that person a descendant of American slavery in America? And we're going to get on the caveat to that because there is still a caveat to it. See, we're going to have to start getting this stuff straight. Now, some people, myself, both of my parents are descendants of American slavery. They are both foundational black Americans. I don't have no immigrants in my family whatsoever. Not one. Nobody in my family is an immigrant. None. None. So we're going to get these rules straight tonight. Tonight we're getting the rules straight because, see, we got to have codification. If you have an immigrant family member, an immigrant parent, and a foundational parent, you are still a foundational black American. Let's be very clear. If there's a reparations claim, yes, you come from a lineage. If you can trace them back, well, you are owed reparations on your parent's side. If they are foundational black American, at least one you are qualified for reparations, all right? Now, let's be clear. There's a caveat. And before I get into the caveat, now, some people want to know, how do, you, how do I trace my family back? It's very simple. They started adding foundational black Americans to the census in large numbers in 1870. 1870 is the first time they started to add foundational black Americans in detail to the census. That's five years after the emancipation of in slavery, okay? So you should be able to trace your family's name or your background, at least one parent, back to that census. At least one parent back to that census. That's the easiest way. Also, the 1900 census, the year of 1900, they had another census that was more detailed. In the 1900 census, they had categories for race, citizenship, because remember, there were a lot of immigrants coming in. A lot of African and black immigrants weren't coming, I mean, Caribbean immigrants weren't coming in at the time. They didn't really have a whole plethora of Caribbean and African immigrants coming over. I mean, you can count them by hand. Not enough to be consequential like that. It was very few. And also in the early 1900s, it was black organizations that were helping Caribbeans come over, okay? It's black people, we're helping Marcus Garvey and people like that come over, okay? But you should also be able, if you go to the 1900 census, the year 1900, they would have race, citizenship, and nativity, meaning the birthplace of a person's parents. Where were your parents born? So all of that is documented. So if you said your parents were born in Jamaica, well, you probably is not a foundational black American. If your parents were born in North Carolina, then you are a foundational black American on the um, 1900 census. See, this, is, this genealogy is very important. 
this genealogy thing is very important when we start getting that reparations claim going for real, for real. See, we got to do the groundwork and know where to go so that people can get their paperwork in order. Okay. So now if you can have, if you have a plausible, legitimate piece of documentation about your lineage showing that you are a foundational black American using those two censuses, using those two, you good. Okay. You should be able to trace your shit back to one of those two censuses, okay? Because in 1870, no, there weren't no black people immigrating over here, okay? There wasn't no black people really immigrating over here, especially in those significant numbers. That, that just wasn't happening, okay? Not in significant numbers. Now, like I said, the half FBA people, now, this is where it gets tricky. Like I said, you are still an FBA. You're still a foundational black American. And the thing is, certain half FBA people, especially if they have family who immigrated here after 1970, half FBA people should not be considered spokespersons for foundational black Americans as a group, okay? Let me say that again. We're breaking this stuff down very meticulously. If you are a half FBA and your family immigrated here, the one part of your family immigrated here after 1970, you should not be able or considered by the rest of us as a spokesperson for foundational black Americans as a group, okay? Now, why do I say that? See, we gotta do it like that. Now, why do we do it like that? Why do we do it like that? Because this is the thing. This is very important. Before 1965, before the Immigration Act that foundational black Americans helped get through, the black immigrants that we helped get over before then were riders. The black immigrants before 1965 who came here did not have the same mentality as black immigrants who came after 1970. Okay? Before 1965, the immigrants who were over here, because of Jim Crow, they had no other option but to get on code with us and live among us and build with us. This is why we would elevate the Marcus Garveys. This is why we would elevate half FBA, like Malcolm X. He was half FBA, but he was a writer. We elevated him because he understood he had to be on code with us. They did not have an exploitive mentality when it came to us. They knew they had to get on code with us and they were riders. Our great brother, Minister Farrakhan, his family's from the Caribbean. That's why he's such a great leader now and a spokesperson now because he came from an era before 1965 where you had to be down with foundational black American society. We knew the common thread and the common enemy so we got on code. This is why we're very important. We got to get the details together. Why after 1970, the shit changed. Why? Because 1968, 69, 70, 71, that was the height of Cointelpro. At the height of Cointelpro, we have to understand how meticulous Cointelpro was. With Cointelpro, they made sure that there would not be a rise of a black messiah. They did not want another Marcus Garvey. Remember, the first person the FBI targeted who was black was Marcus Garvey because we were elevating Marcus Garvey. Somebody said it's harsh. No, we got to be harsh. We going to be harsh. Stokely Carmichael was from Trinidad. He was a writer. He came before that 1965 ruling. So when all of the black immigrants were coming over, when we fought to get them over, white supremacist society said, okay, okay. We're going to have to start infiltrating some of these immigrants who come over and among black society. We're going to have to start screening for coons to undermine these niggas. This started in the 70s. So they started to incentivize African immigrants and Caribbean immigrants to 
work against us, to undermine us, to give them certain resources. Right around this time, this is when the Congressional Black Caucus was formed. They started to get those boule niggas and put some of those Caribbean boule niggas all up in the Congressional Black Caucus and all of these little under, these little civic black groups. They started to load them up with these immigrant coons and they started to come up with policies of benign neglect. Benign neglect started at around 1972. Around the 1970 era, era the, the benign neglect policies came through. So it was, it was a time to ignore foundational black Americans and prioritize immigrant groups. So a lot of these dangerous Negro seeds started being sown at that time. You dig? So we got to look at history and really operate our business accordingly to benefit us. You dig? So, because a lot of these folks started coming over, white supremacist society started to incentivize them to look at us to exploit us. Now, it, notice, since 1960, we, we haven't been able to get on code like we should have been. When it comes to bus boycotts and all that, we got on code because it was just us. We knew how to immediately get on code. Now, we can't get a successful boycott for shit because these tether niggas will break the boycott. Everything is, is to undermine us to a certain degree. And I'm not talking about all, but hell, too many. Not all, but too many. Now, the thing is, we have to watch out with pe for people who have these dual allegiances. Okay? We got to watch out for people who have dual allegiances and dual alliances with so-called us and their homeland. Because, see, let me tell you something. There's a danger to dual allegiances. And historically, there's been two types of half FBA individuals, okay? Let's go back to the half FBA people. There's two types since 1970, okay? There's two types, and we got this on the website. Number one, you have loyalists who are loyal to FBA. They're loyal to the lineage. They're loyal to the heritage. And the second type you have are the anchor tethers who look at black society and foundational black society as some group to exploit and to replace. You understand? Those are the two types of half FBAs we have. We have some who are down and loyal to the FBA side. And we have those who want to exploit us. For example, Candace Owens, she likes to talk about how one of her parents came from a plan uh, or descended from a plantation, but she's always aligned herself with the Caribbean side of her family. And I even doubt that she has a FBA family member, by the way. I really doubt that. I need to see the paperwork. But notice all of the Negroes that get elevated are either half FBA with dual allegiances or full immigrants who undermine us. Roland Martin's ass. Notice all Roland Martin does is try to undermine foundational black Americans. Candace Owens. They elevate these Negroes to say, hey, look, I'm half black American and half Caribbean, and I say we shouldn't get reparations. That other coon that they put up there for the reparations thing, that Puerto Rican coon. Hey, I'm black. We shouldn't get reparations either. Then we did some research on that nigga. He's Puerto Rican. So now, family, as foundational black Americans, we should not allow half FBA people whose family came over after 1970 to be spokespersons for us as a group. Unless, now there's a caveat to that, unless there's a but to it, unless that person has a verified track record of loyalty and tangible contributions to the betterment of foundational black society on a grassroots level. 
The only way we will let a half FBA person be the spokesperson for us is if they have a tangible track record of doing things for the betterment of foundational black American society. You understand? You have to have a track record of loyalty, of doing things to better foundational black American society. You got to have a track record of doing it. If you got a track record of just running your fucking mouth and criticizing us, just shut, keep shutting the fuck up. That brings us to our brother Nipsey. Nipsey was a half foundational black American. His family was from Eritrea. His mother was foundational black American. But Nipsey did things for the foundational black American community. That brother was extremely loyal. That brother created all types of opportunities for foundational black Americans. That brother went out there in the streets and fought for foundational black Americans. That brother was a rider for foundational black Americans. Nipsey was different from some of these tethered coons. Nipsey is a great example of that. That's why we elevate that brother to a damn deity to a certain degree. We elevate, elevate that brother because he was a rider for us. He wasn't over here trying to exploit. That brother built and created all types of opportunities that folks don't even know about. That's, that's a rider. That brother was a rider. You hear? Nip was a real one. People like that, yes, because he has a track record of doing the right thing. He never tried to undermine us. He respected his Eritrean culture, but he respected us and did everything he could. Me personally, Nipsey did a lot of good shit, but me personally, I'm telling you from personal experience with Nipsey. And then, was a writer. People like that, yes. Our brother, Colin Kaepernick. Colin's mother, his biological mother is white. Colin's dad is black, foundational black American. But he's a writer. He put his life on the line and his career on the line for the betterment of black people. Colin Kaepernick is a writer. That's who we're talking about. You better have a track record of putting in work for foundational black society. And even if you're not foundational black American, even if you're uh, from an immigrant class, we respect you, but we, we don't need anybody who's not from foundational black American culture to act as a spokesperson for us. Okay? We got to be very clear on that. See, we got to respect our foundational black American bloodline. Angela Rise, an immigrant, that's Haitian, Haitian immigrant. Notice all of these people, there's a reason, family, there's a reason why white supremacist society elevates all of these either full non-FBAs or half FBA people as spokespersons for us. They know that a lot of these people will have dual allegiances. And that's the thing, family, we got to get on code about that. We can't let anybody with dual allegiances Speak for us. Also, if you are a foundational black American and you have dual allegiances to a religion, meaning you prioritize a religion over the racial group and the ethnic group, you cannot be a spokesperson. We're going to have to get busy like this. If you prioritize your religious, so-called religious beliefs or whatever, over the ethnic group, you shouldn't be a spokesperson if you prioritize sexual intersectionality over the ethnic group you should not be a spokesperson because you can be compromised we have to look into the backgrounds of people who try to speak for us see we're no longer going to be slop buckets Every week, they got some mushmouth Negro on TV talking about, hey, I represent black folks, and I say we need to stop all that riding and looting. Every fucking day, they done put some nigga we don't know as our representative. We have to say, okay, that person is nullified among us. We're not listening to him. That person does not represent us. We have to cut that short. And see, that's a code, and they can't do anything about that because the code is in here. The code is in here. Family, the minute we see anybody talking about, hey, I'm here to speak for black Americans and foundation of black Americans and what they need, okay, what's your background? We ain't taking any more niggas who come out of nowhere. Nigga, 
What's your pedigree? We ain't taking no more niggas who done came out of nowhere. Because if you done came out of nowhere and don't nobody on the streets know you, that means you some tether that they done put out. They done got you from some white think tank and push you out here. They done got you from that boule think tank and push your ass out here. Yeah? Anybody who speaks for foundational black Americans should be a full-blooded foundational black American. Your bloodlines matter. Let me tell you something. Don't let nobody fool you on that. Other folks value their bloodlines. Other people value their bloodlines. Especially in white society. They value bloodlines like crazy. You dig? And, and to get in certain positions, you have to have a certain bloodline. Family, you can't be president unless you come from a certain bloodline. Yeah? Family, you cannot be the president of the United States unless you come from a particular bloodline. Bloodlines are very important among everybody except us. See, we're the slop bucket people. See, they treat us like the mutts of society. That's what you do when you just throw everything in there. You create a fucking mutt. But with every other group, oh, no, 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 no. You can't. No, not you. Not you. Oh, no. They, they're very scientifically pairing their folks. The Blue Vein Society. So you can't get into certain positions in, in wealthy white society without your bloodline being in order. Over there in the royal family, over there in Europe. We saw what happened when Meghan Markle came through. They got her ass up out of there. Meghan Markle somewhere in Compton right now, working at Chick-fil-A. I don't know what she's doing. They got her out of there. They got Princess Diana out of there. When Princess Diana, when they said she was pregnant by Dodi Fayed, that non-white Muslim, all of a sudden, they said, wait a minute, they're tainting the bloodline again. Uh-uh. They're about to taint the royal bloodline. They're about to taint the royal bloodline with Moorish royalty. Nah, she got to go. Mmm. They're very meticulous about bloodlines. During slavery, those plantation owners, they would be very meticulous about who they would, the, the other southern white families they would breed into. They were very meticulous about that. They would get hooked up with other wealthy plantation families a lot. This is why even today, a lot of these southern families all clicked in with each other. Oh, a lot of these southern families are hella clicked in with each other. You then even a lot of African tribes, even today, they're meticulous about the Igbo and Yoruba and Asante, all of these people coming from a Yoruba, Asante, all that, a, a background and a lineage from the people from that tribe. They're very meticulous about that in Africa now. You got two black ass people, but I'm not fucking with you. You ain't Yoruba. Both of them black than a motherfucker. But no, nigga, you ain't Ebo. I can't, no, you're not Ebo. Now, some of those African tribes, they'll change it up as a white man. That's the, that's the exception. The, the white man is the bingo card for them now. They'll change up those lineage rules if it's white daddy. All right? Over there, the tribalism is heavy. You got to be Ebo, goddammit. Ebo, but oh, it's white daddy? Okay. That's the joker card right there. Getting you a white daddy. Yeah. But the thing is, when other groups started to infiltrate bloodlines, that is usually the demise in a lot of their cultures. And when you let people infiltrate the bloodline and then let those people act as spokespersons for the group, that would be a problem. Because this isn't, we're human beings. It's inevitable that people are going to mix up and all that. But when you have a specific culture and a specific ethnic group that has specific codes and they have a specific agenda, it's very important to not let people with dual alliances infiltrate. 
and then take the direction of the group somewhere else. See, this is where we got to step up to that. Let's go back to Africa. In Africa, that was the, the downfall of a lot of African societies. The Portuguese would go over there and they had something called lencados. Those Portuguese um, colonizers would go over to Africa in the 14th and 15th hundreds and 1600s, and they would marry into royal black families, royal African families over there. And the offspring of those Portuguese and black people, they had more of an allegiance with their Portuguese fathers. Those were some of the people that really helped facilitate the um, triangular slave trade. They were big time on the slave trade. They were the ones setting up shop over there in Cape Verde, and Cape Verde, by the way, before 14, the year 1460, there was no such thing as a Cape Verdean, by the way. The island of Cape Verde was deserted. There was nobody there. Cape Verdeans are a created race. Just like Mexicans. Mexicans are a created race. There was no such thing as a Mexican before um, the 1500s. But the thing is, they went over there into Africa and did Angola and all this and started to marry in to these black families and then these offspring, these half African, half Portuguese, they became representatives for African culture and everything went all to hell. The Arabs went into places like Zanzibar, Tanzania, and I've been over there extensively, studied in the museums. Some of the offspring of the African women in the African and the Arab fathers became staunch slave owners. Tipu Tip is a very infamous black mixed, he's black as hell, but he was mixed with Arab and black, had more of an affinity with his father. He was a major slave trader in East Africa. Tipu Tip made a, an immense amount of wealth being a slave trader because this person aligned with the colonizer side of the family the explorative side, and white society elevated him. You understand? That's the thing. The white supremacists who he was selling slaves to, they sided with him and elevated him and cashed him up. See, they know how to get the half people, the half breeds of the society, or the half um, cultures of society. Even the Native American cultures, even if it's Native American, they did the same thing. Native American cultures, in order to be a chief, you had to have a certain bloodline in order to be a chief. Now, you know, they knew they mixed up with different tribes, but in order to be a chief in a Native American tribe, they were very particular about the, the bloodlines. And when white daddy started to mix in with these Native American tribes, all of a sudden, you started getting these white and Native American chiefs. That's when everything went all to hell with them. You see, when you start mixing with different groups, mixing with different ethnic groups, and then you let those people become the spokespersons for your ethnic group and they have dual allegiances, that creates problems. That creates problems, okay? That's major. That creates a lot of problems. And family, this goes in, into the underworld. This goes into the underworld. Family, even in the mafia, for a long time in the mafia, you would let, they would let other people in who were Italian, but they were mixed with something else. They would let people in, but you could not be a made man, meaning a boss. You couldn't be a made man, you couldn't be a boss unless both of your parents came from Sicily. Because they didn't want anybody, number one, with dual allegiances who could snitch. And also, they wanted to be able to trace your family. If you did some shit that was slick, they wanted to find, they wanted to know they can find both sides of your family and give them that damn work. So if you cross them, you put your family in danger. Because everybody knew where to trace their asses. Now, if you were mixed with something else and your family was from Germany somewhere, but one part, a family member was from, from Italy... 
and you did something slick, they don't, you know, they don't know how to go get at your family. Like, for example, Henry Hill from the movie Goodfellas. Henry Hill was half Italian and half Irish. And they allowed him in the mafia. He was a foot soldier for the mafia. But because he was half Irish, they would not let him become a made man because they understood a person who has dual allegiances, they could snitch on us. And that's exactly what he did. That's exactly what he did. That's the reason why they want, they didn't have him as a made man. They didn't want to let this dude up around the inner circles with sensitive information that he can really bring everything down. That's why they did not let him become a made man because they knew he was a potential snitch just by being mixed like that, just by having dual allegiances. They knew the importance of it. Yeah, that's why. He, and he snitched. They, they were right. They knew he would potentially snitch, and he did. Now, later on, I think they, you know, relaxed a lot of the shit with some of the bloodlines, I think, because at one point you had to be from Sicily. Then they switched it to be a made man. You got to be from Italy. So they switched it up a little bit. But, you know, they, they had very strict rules in order to have their particular group thrive and have them represent that group. We cannot have, okay, yeah, you're part of our thing, but... On this level, because of your heritage, we just, out of respect for us, you just can't be here. You just can't be on this level because this is set for a certain group of us. We got to have that same mentality. And we're going to have that same mentality. 